Come on, guys, wake up! Hey, don't break my canoe! Go ahead, throw her in the water. Darien is a region where there are no roads. Everything is handmade. Everything depends on the river. Get moving, Triliancito, go! Pablo, go ahead, come on, come on! Pull! Pull! We follow these everyday heroes for whom every trip, every movement is a struggle against nature. Careful, okay? Anything broken? Everything in Darien is wild, savage, danger lurks at every moment. Hey, look, it's a jaguar's den. That's where they hide. This is a land for adventure and fantasy, as well as greed. For gold, people will kill. It's also the gateway to the United States for illegal refugees who dream of a new life. 800 bucks. Uh, nobody told us this. We'd agreed in Bogota. They're at the mercy of the smugglers, whose only creed is the dollar. In this green hell, an impenetrable jungle, where nobody knows the way to the border, humans and destiny intersect. In their own way, everyone struggles to survive in the Darien. It's the region of the impossible. The Tuira River is the gateway to this region at the end of the world, where time glides past as slowly as the water. Here, the river is the tarmac. The canoes are the cars and trucks. Nothing is mechanized. It takes brute strength to travel. Loading and unloading can take hours. A truck full of goods has just arrived from Panama City. It belongs to a woman they called the Queen of the River Tuira. The Queen is Gina, a 55-year-old store owner. It's hard to believe, but Gina assures us that her pigs and two and a half tons of merchandise will travel on this little boat. Everything there is mine. It's for my supermarket. Rice, sugar, gas, beverages, oil. What's the value of these goods? Two and a half thousand dollars. Come on, sweetheart. Every ten days, the Queen transports her merchandise to a little village, a full day's river journey away. Food and also fuel. It's the region's most precious commodity, so the most expensive. There's 1,500 liters on board. Who are you going to sell this to? Now to the people in the community, in my village, because they need fuel. In addition to her shop, Gina also acts as a freight manager on behalf of others. It's a set for the lounge and the dining room. A lounge and a dining room? Sure. They were very well packaged and we'll deliver them to the owner. I get paid a commission to carry them. Gina employs 12 men. Even so, the loading will take almost an entire day. And the loading must be done quickly. The chicken won't survive in the heat, and in this region the weather is unpredictable. And this table can be put there, under cover. Uh, the table and, and the living room furniture. You'll need to carry it. Good, just like that. Mine is the right way up, huh? Do you always supervise this yourself? Oh yes, it's part of my job. If I don't look after the merchandise, who will? Nobody. That's the thing. Loading the cans of fuel is the most dangerous operation. There are seven 200 kilo cans. With no machines to help, they do as best they can.
Gina has spent over half her life on the river, building up her business. She has four children and is now grandmother to young Chuhi. He's only four, but the queen has made him her heir. She takes him everywhere. She says to teach him the job. Chui, if you eat everything, I'll give you a soda. It's the end of the day at the harbor. Time for a break for the family to watch a spectacle on the river Tuira that occurs only twice a year. Chuhi loves it. It's also the end of the road for the cows. The truck cannot go further. To get the cattle into the fields, there's a chance for some rodeo. It's physically taxing and dangerous. The cows seem to know they won't be traveling first class. And these latest passengers are not treated with kid gloves. These girls will take 30 minutes to reach their new pastures. The cows don't suffer? No, they don't. They're used to it? They like the water, it's cool. But isn't it dangerous for them? No, it's dangerous for us, not for them. They can swim, we can't. Well, many of them are drowned. No, no. Oh, yeah, the last time one did drown. Oh, yeah, she died and we ate her. How much do you earn doing this job? Well, a good worker and six dollars a day, plus food and alcohol. And what do you drink? Rum. And that's free too, the rum. <laughs> the gauchos are hot this afternoon. They've started early to celebrate the weekend, a way of building up courage. Another hundred animals have to be transported. When they arrive, the heavily built cows are exhausted. They're tired. Oh, we'll put them in their pens tonight so they can recover. And tomorrow we'll let them out into the fields. To get them out, the cowboys sometimes take extreme measures. Not forgetting a little local touch. It's 5.30 in the morning in the port of Yaviza, and Gina is stirring. To ensure a good night's sleep, she keeps her merchandise as close by as possible. Before the boss gets up, everything must be loaded, the meat included. Hello. I'm wide awake, thank God. I need to get on with my work. Pipillo, where should I sit? The canoe. Come on, you have to untie it. 
Excuse me. You're not afraid of falling? No, look, I'm used to it. For me, it's natural. I've never fallen in the water. Bye, Yavisa. See you soon. Boca de Coupe, Gina's small village, is a three-day journey from Panama City. A day by truck to Yavisa, then no more roads. And things start to get complicated. In winter, it takes seven hours to reach Boca de Coupe, close to the border with Colombia. In summer, when the water levels are much lower, the trip becomes a more than 12-hour long nightmare. Gina's canoe is 35 years old. Its 12 meter long hull weighed down by the two and a half ton load and powered along by a small 40 horsepower engine at full throttle. The old canoe is so low in the water that the wake of any boat it crosses causes a flood on board. Now, many canoes have already been sunk that way by being flooded by passing boats. Some don't care and just travel too fast and too close. To make sure they stay afloat, the owner has instructed one of her clerks to bail water all day long so that she can relax. The first stages of the trip along the Twira are worthy of a tourist river cruise. A trip through primeval jungle and a chance to glimpse wild animals many might pay good money for. After two hours, the relaxing break comes to an end. Gina gets back down to business, ensuring her merchandise gets to customers on the waterfront. This brand new living room and dining room will soon be in their new home. Is this a good deal? Well, oh, whenever I have the space in my canoe, I do it. We come past here anyway, so it costs us nothing. And it's an extra $40, no, which is better than nothing. A few kilometers away, on the other side of the border, lies the small village of Alto Baudo. Wedged between mountains, it's one of the most remote parts of Colombia. Tomorrow the school is due to open, but the teacher hasn't arrived yet. She has a good excuse. The path to school is long and steep. Delfina Mosquera has arrived from the city, where she spent the summer holidays. The first leg is a few hours' journey by canoe. Here, too, there is no road to the village, where she teaches on the other side of the mountain. The mayor himself has turned out to greet her. Hello, Don Abelino. How are you? Good, thank you. So what treat do you have in store for me today? Oh, my affection, as always. The mayor has a surprise for his special guest. The second part of the journey, she will travel courtesy of a unique transportation company. The company employs the most resourceful and strongest men from the village. Come on, the chairs are nearly finished. Okay, let's go. The school teacher, all her school supplies and her two assistants will all travel on the backs of these professional porters called paseros. Where's my rifle? Okay, let's go. These are scenes from another century, the colonial era, when the Spanish used the natives as human mules. When slavery was abolished, the paseros disappeared, except here. 
Men continue to carry other humans to earn a penny. By and large, their fares are women, the infirm, or the weak. The first hours are a long climb in 35 degree heat through thick forest, and on trails only these men can take. Dario, put me down, please. I want to light some candles for the Virgin. At the top of the mountain, a pause in front of the Madonna provides reassurance to some and a welcome break to others. The hardest part of the journey, the descent, is still to come. This is the first time I'm going this way in a chair. It's, it's very scary. It's horrible. I was dizzy. You get the feeling you're going to fall off the chair any minute. But still, it's better than walking. The skill of an acrobat along slippery steps the Pazeros have dug into the rock over the centuries. We're going down. Horses and mules couldn't go this way. This path isn't made for horses and mules. I mean, there's no room for a horse. Everything okay? Nothing broken? Carrying more than 100 kilos on one's back is a miraculous balancing act. It's very dangerous. People have fallen into the ravine because of the weight or simply because they lost their balance. There have been many accidents here. And it's very hard work, but we're used to it. After a half day of effort, the little village of Alto Baudo and the school are finally in sight. Delivered on time, the teacher will be there for the new term. To celebrate the arrival of the teacher, the village has hosted a race. A strange race, only to be found in these parts. These physically powerful men are respected and looked up to in the village. Carrying a child, the racers complete a circuit. What's he done? 21 minutes. The man of the day. He's won with a two minute lead over the others and the result of a superhuman effort. A man carrier, a trade from another era. It's a job that allows the village of Alto Baldo to survive and Delfina, the teacher, to educate children in the depths of the jungle. <laughs> the scene is surprising for this remote area. Queen Gina has received a call from the village. Hello, daughter. Yes, we've just left Yavisa last business meeting with her secretary and in a few minutes the phone will no longer work. Going deeper into the mountains the danger rises as the water levels drop. At this junction of rivers the skill of her boatman makes all the difference. He must weave between the tree trunks carried downstream as a result of violent storms. When the river is clear you can see the tree trunks but even if we see them the canoe might still hit the wreckage. You have confidence in your helmsman? Oh, absolutely, 100%. He's worked for me for 16 years. And naturally, no one on board has a life jacket. At midday, it'll be time to sit down to lunch. And in order not to fall behind schedule, I'm making salad. Gina has thought of everything in case of the unexpected. We've no more gas. What's wrong with him? 
I need six gallons of gas to get to the village. Okay, calm down. We'll, we'll get you some. You see, they didn't buy enough gas for the trip, and now they've run out. The engine uses a lot of gasoline, so I'll give them a hand. It's a blessing from God if you hadn't been here. What would have become of us? We'd have never made it to Boca de Coupe before nightfall. Gina, queen of the river Tuira, is also its guardian angel. Rice and chicken and sauce accompanied by a small green salad. Gina, the boss, is also a chef. Lunch break for the whole crew. The village of Pinogana marks the midpoint of the journey. Everyone must stop here. It's a typical quiet town with a military garrison. All along the river, the Panamanian border police search each boat. A short distance away is Colombia. It's a country that's been at war for 30 years and the world's largest producer of cocaine. The military are looking for drugs and guns and food for the Colombian guerrillas. Even the queen must show her papers. The search lasts an hour as her canoe is thoroughly inspected. The police say it's a routine check of the goods that I'm carrying. But since the border with Colombia is close by, the police suspect we may be supplying the guerrillas. But we've never even seen one guerrilla. On this stretch of the river, the police have imposed a curfew. At 6 p.m., all traffic is banned. In fact, the military are also trying to stop the flow of illegal immigrants heading north for the United States. For some, life seems to be a bed of roses, but not for these men and women who've come from far away. These illegal immigrants from Africa have entrusted their lives into the hands of three smugglers and their canoe. Now, in the jungle, comes the riskiest part of their passage to the United States. They need to cross one of the most tense and hostile areas in the world. At any time, they might be seized by the army and sent back to their own country. It all started 48 hours earlier in Turbo, northern Colombia. It's the point of departure for the well-organized human traffic. After several days of bargaining, the head of the smugglers confirms the illegal immigrants will leave the same evening at 11 p.m. on board one of these fishing canoes. At the appointed hour, we quietly leave the city with the smugglers, ostensibly to go fishing at sea. Our presence makes the crew nervous, fearing it might alert the police. Lower your light and your camera. Careful, and watch out for the branches. They're there. The Somalis, they're hiding over there. Waiting in a marshy area are 16 illegal immigrants, 12 men and four women. They've been here for two weeks, hiding inside a house. Come over here, come over here, get, it, get in the front. Once away from the city, the boatman steps on the gas. We must travel the greatest possible distance at night to foil the army patrols. It's a three-hour crossing on a rough sea, then through the night along the Rio Sucio, the Saltwater River. The helmsman navigates blindly.
Suddenly, we hit a tree trunk and there's panic on board. Musi, one of the Eritreans, is about to explode. No problem, be quiet, it's okay. Oh, uh oh, damn, look. A second tree trunk nearly impaled the boat. We avoid being sunk, though. Why, why is there all this water in the boat? Oh, it's always wet. Look, see, it comes in here and there. It's fine, it's normal, there's water. Tonight, the illegals have once again escaped death. They've brushed with death several times since starting their ordeal. They come from Sudan, Eritrea, Somalia, even Bangladesh. First, they flew or sailed across the Atlantic for Ecuador, a country for which they don't need a visa. From Ecuador, they head for Colombia. On foot, by boat, or by truck, their final goal is the United States and the hope of a new life. The immigrants have left the city of Turbo in Colombia. To reach Panama without getting caught by the military, they have to cross the near impenetrable jungle, the Darien. In the morning, fatigue adds to the tension. After the Rio Sucio, there's a swamp infested with crocodiles. The vegetation is so dense that it wraps around the propeller. The engine heats up and threatens to break down. 13,000 kilometers from home and completely lost, these men and women nevertheless keep going. They can only trust their own faith and the smugglers. These new, unknown masters of their destiny. The sun has been beating down since dawn. The water levels continue to fall and progress is slow. In this little corner of the world, we have no idea where we are. But Roberto, the leader of the smugglers, seems to be enjoying himself. He's planning to hike the prices. Who speaks the best Spanish, you? Here, the guide needs half the money. Half the money. You say he needs half the money now, the guide, to get to the border. Half money for the second guide to go to the border. Uh, half of the money. Half of the money. How much is he saying? Cuánto es? Ochocientos. Eight hundred dollars now, and eight hundred at the border. He tells us that we have got a deal there in Bogota. Just they gave us hundred dollar each. There's a discussion, but it will be brief. Resigned, all talk of revolt is quashed. Everyone takes out their dollars. Eight hundred for sixteen people. They're reluctant, but have no choice. There's $800. The boatman receives his share with no qualms and, proud of his work, leaves happy.
The group starts off. It will be a long day. The border with Panama is close. Further north, in the forest. Another group of men is on the move towards another paradise. These are not immigrants, but prospectors returning to a mine. In this jungle full of surprises, it's best to be armed, to defend themselves and to hunt for food. He's there, look. Go ahead, shoot. Yeah, he's on the branch, look. He fell. <laughs> what is it? It's a palacantona. Una palacantona. Is it good? Sí. Oh yeah. To make soup, it's very tasty. Their weapons are not only for hunting, but also to repel predators. It's hard to walk here. The road is dangerous. There are many snakes, jaguars, and many pumas in this jungle. There, there's a jaguar's den over there. We kill them in those holes there. We shoot them, we get them out of their holes, and then we kill them. This is where they sleep. Mercury, Patacon, and Rubens have come from their small village, where they've parted for three days. Here's our small camp, our little base. But since they have no more money, they return to work on this river, the Rio Sabado. The natives know this river well and for centuries have been looking for the most precious of minerals, gold. Using this homemade machine, which is essentially a vacuum cleaner, they plunge underwater to scour the riverbed. They suck up the sand, which then settles into a sieve. After two days of work, the moment of truth. Will there be gold, and how much? I think I see some specks. How much do you think you've got there? I don't know, it's hard to say. This traditional method of panning may reveal some golden flakes. But don't you lose lots of gold doing it that way? No, if you do it gently, the gold won't wash away. The heavier gold remains at the bottom of the bowl. Look at that. That's more than one gram, surely. Is that good? Oh yeah, $25 a gram. Look at how the gold shows up. So I guess you're happy. Yeah, it's taken two days to finally find something. The gold will fetch barely $50, but it's enough to celebrate with before returning here and beginning work again. At any moment, we could find a lot of gold. If we do, then I don't know what we'd do. We'd go straight back to the village, go a bit crazy and spend, drink, dance. If we find 50 or 100 grams, we'll go crazy. It's like gold fever. 
Yeah, gold fever, gold crazy. But too much gold is evil. You don't know what to do. You go mad. You know, for gold, people would kill. It's the fifth hour of the trek, and the immigrants had no idea such a living hell was possible. America is still far away. How are you, Mamun? How, 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 How are you feeling? Oh, thanks. In this forest where even hardened adventurers have given up, they only have their city clothes, their light shoes, and their entire belongings carried on their backs. Whatever they have or don't have, they must press on. They walk without knowing exactly where. Suddenly, a black tarpaulin indicates signs of life. It's a base camp. The group will have to wait here for several hours for a new smuggler to guide them. Where are we, Jorge? Where are we? Right next to the border. The location is unclear, but what is certain is that the camp regularly accommodates illegal immigrants. For now, neither the army nor the guerrillas have discovered its existence. Our biggest problem is the army. To prevent the military arresting them, the illegals are taken here, and then we get them across the border. In the late morning, it's almost 40 degrees. 40 degrees of humidity, mosquito weather. The sleepless night and difficult walk have left their mark. Bruises on both body and soul. One of the illegals agrees to tell us his story on condition of anonymity. Why did you choose to leave Africa? Yes, I'm from Eritrea. The government put me in a jail for almost six months. Then from that, I escaped from the jail and I will not come back to my country. How was the price of this trip? Much more money, about $15,000 or $16,000. To finish line? To finish the line, yeah. And um, uh, how did you get this money? Uh, some of them by working, and some of them uh, my family helped, helped me. How old are you? Um, I'm 26. And what is your dream? In a... Just to live peacefully in America. Just to live peacefully, to work, to collect uh, money, and to help my family. That's my view. The hours tick away, and there's still no sign of the new smuggler. The other major concern is the quantity of food and drinking water, both of which are now dangerously low. Roberto, the chief smuggler, shows us that water can be found all around us. No problem. This water is safe to drink. No problem. It's like fruit juice. You can drink this, no problem. See? No problem. In the afternoon, the second smuggler finally shows up at the camp in his canoe. But once again, there's confusion and another crisis meeting. Why you leave us here? Dijeron ellos que van a van a traer un bote para que yo paguen el bote. You have to pay the new boat. Ah, the new boat. El bote pagan ustedes. How much? Ustedes. How much is it? No sé cuánto le vayan a cobrar. Él no sabe. 
Pero entonces, de ahí para allá, así, de ahí para allá los guías, 800 en, en, para el límite. Tell him to tell that to yo, yo the man at the border. Yeah. When he finish the all, boat all the and the, we'll give the rest money there. Tell him. Okay, okay. Ma salam. Okay, my friend. Yeah. Okay. For once, and this is the first time the migrants are successful, it's a small victory. The smugglers forbid us to film any further or to continue with them, to keep the border crossing secret. It will be four months before we have any more news. These Somalis, Eritreans, Sudanese and Bangladeshis did finally achieve their dream, their American dream. The hardest thing to take on the river is the sun, burning, stultifying, almost 40 degrees. For Gina, it's time for a siesta. The rest is all too short. The engine cannot do it alone. The river is very dry. Now we'll have to get in the water and, and raise the canoe against the current. It's always like that in the summer. In winter, it's not like that at all. But now, in the summer, it's very hard, very difficult. The entire crew, apart from little Chewy, is forced to get into the water. They have to use brute force to push three tons against the current. In the village, they know Gina is on her way. A boatload of children is on its way to lend a hand. We're trying to head up. Fortunately, there are people in the village who will pick us up. Pablo, go ahead. Kina, get into the water and grab the rope. Start to pull it. Push. The canoe is too light and can't make it. And now the engine stalls and the canoe begins to drift. Gina sees that the canoe is heading straight for her own vessel. They narrowly avoid a collision. Come on, harder, Tuliosito. You need to put it down in this canoe. Come on this side and grab the can. Come on! Twelve hours to cover just 30 kilometers. It's now three days since they left Panama City. Hooray, we've arrived at Boca de Coupe. Hooray! Now we must untie and unload the other dugout. As usual, the village children jump for joy when they see Gina and her team. Boca de Coupe is a typical, easy-going Darien village with a population of some 2,000. In this little paradise in the middle of nowhere, Afro and native Panamanians live peacefully together in a village where there's neither running water nor telephones. People live here from agriculture, primarily bananas. These, these bananas are plantains. 
They're very nice. They're the best. The plantations are located a few hours' walk from the village. The work is tedious in furnace-like conditions and the pay is paltry, just $5 a day per person. Gina escaped this life of slavery. Due to her business, she's become the richest and most important woman in the village. Welcome to my little palace. This is my grocery store. This is your life's work, right, Gina? Oh, yes, this is my pride and joy. Because I work for Darien and for the people of Darien. And this is my husband. Together we've made all of this possible. But success comes at a cost. While her husband mines the grocery store, Gina, the nomad, lives on the road. In two days, to refurnish her stock, she will leave once again for Panama City. Another challenging journey fraught with pitfalls. All the sacrifices I have made in my life are on behalf of my children, because tomorrow or the day after, when I finally close my eyes, they will inherit everything. I didn't have that opportunity. So at least, when I die, I'll die happy, because I've left something for my children. That way, they will have something to raise their children with, because God has given me that possibility. You must never tell Gina that she's a great woman. Her answer will be that for the people of Darien, nothing is impossible. <laughs>